It's becoming more and more important and respected. I'd like, I'd like to, to give you an also an overview of the classes, classes of drugs that we use for injections in sports medicine. And to generalize it, you have like three big uh, categories. You have the synthetic drugs that we are used to have like for lots of decades, more than 50 years. It's like the corticosteroids, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the hyaluronic acid. So these are all the synthetic built drugs. They are not, uh, not natural by um, by their content, but um, <clears throat> um, on the other hand, we do have these homeopathic and, and herbal drugs that we especially in Germany are used for a long time. Um, nowadays, we call them low-dose phytopharmacals, it's like uh, Tramil or Seal, so these low-dose multi-component uh, uh, drugs. And then we do have the newer orthobiologicals. Um, so these are class like PRP um, that mostly are driven from, from blood and uh, contains uh, part of the serum. And we also do have the cell therapy um, with the multipotent musculoskeletal stem cells. So these are the drug classes we use. And just to give you the, some reasons why we haven't sticked to these old type of uh, classical synthetic drugs. So uh, if you want to treat uh, inflammation, it's very close that you just use non non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So they're very uh, potent in inhibiting um, inflammation processes in the body. We are used to uh, fertilize them in our, and, and duplicate them in our daily life, in our daily practice. We have lots of um, uh, of knowledge about them, so why don't just use them um, in, in athletes? And they are already used in athletes a lot, much more than we want to have them. Um, but on the other hand, you need these uh, guided and non-overshooting inflammation for some really, really uh, important processes in your body. And one of these processes is the adaption of your body to a uh, training stimulus. So if you inhibit the satellite cells for migration and proliferation, and these are the, it's one of the effects of this non drugs, and then you get repaired muscle regeneration, you get in inhibition of training adaption. So if you use a lot of non drugs like ibuprofen um, in your athletes, um, they will lose uh, treating, a training effect. And lots of, of your, our athletes are not aware of these problems. And nowadays we are we know, we know very exactly how this uh, how this mechanism is. So um, these non-steroidal drugs they are inhibiting the arabidonic acid pathway and um, also in, are inhibiting the expression level of the genes of uh, proteins that you need for muscle up, to build up your muscle. So there's some knowledge around that it's not spread it widely. And uh, we also knew concerning uh, treatment of, of tendons that uh, high use of non steroidal drugs are weakening the enthesis, so the attachment of the tendon to the bone, uh, resulting in a decreased pull out force, like after uh, reconstruction of the supraspinatus tendon, like shown in this uh, study that I, uh, I wrote down here. And uh, the reason is a deficient collagen fiber pattern that is produced by long-standing use of non steroidal drugs. Um, the mode of action is already known and it's the same. So it's the impairment of this uh, inflammation process that is um, really detrimental. Um, on the other hand, the corticosteroids, which we think might be the most powerful in inhibitors for inflammation processes, they're only working on a very, very short time, so the pain and inflammation will come back after you have the single shot. Um, you have a high risk of um, exacerbating diabetes. Um, there's no clinically proven superiority against the local use of non steroidal drugs. Um, and we do know that administering uh, corticosteroids locally to ligaments and tendon will lead to necrosis by inhibiting the collagen synthesis and also inhibiting the proliferation and regeneration of the tenocytes. So frequent and re repetitive use of corticosteroids will really damage your tendons. 
So a couple of decades ago, some uh, very smart people were experimenting and trying new ways of, uh, infl of influencing the infl inflammation process. And they were ending up by looking to some major players that were located in our blood. So there are lots of derivatives from blood components. And for us in the sports medicine, um, the PRP, the platelet-rich plasma, revealed to be the most important one because it's, it's so effective. You all know what's meant by that. So it's a part, it's a component of centrifugated peripheral blood. So not, not more than this, but it's really powerful. So we have more than 10 years experience with using PRP and we, what we saw is that the effect is, um, is there, but on the other hand it's variating a lot. So and to give you one insight why this variability might come from, um, here's one study that shows that the concentration of the active components, um, I mean the, the platelets, um, is, is changing, it's variating by five to ten times uh, within the same person and also between persons. So the amount of platelets in, this, in the peripheral blood is uh, it's not a, const it's not a constant uh, value, so it's, um, it's very, very uh, likely to go down and up um, due to lots of circumstances. So this makes it almost impossible to get a standardized sample. And this might also lead to like a variation of the effect. And then there's a need to administer the PRP sonographic guided. So Atrex is putting a lot of effort to educate doctors and surgeons to do that. And lots of my colleagues there are asking, oh, I have experience just in palpating and giving the injection, so that's enough for me. So I want to give you a... Uh, just as an example, <laughs> that it may be uh, no problem if you have a knee like this on the left side, which is one of our active players, but then you might be, uh, get a knee like in the middle here or maybe a very extreme adipose patient on the right side and then just giving injection intraarticularly to the tendon, the just palpation is like, uh, yes, uh, it's like a game, it's like a lucky game. So. And the ultrasound also allows us to do other interventions like a hematoma aspiration that we often have to do before we can use the PRP. So if there's lots of blood already around in the structured area, then you have to get it out. And you will find it more easily if you use, use a sonographic guided aspiration. Um, you will find the hypoechogenic zones you can put in the needle, you can aspirate. You have to be careful because of anticoagulation. You have to have very sterile conditions, and you have to use the right time point for that. And then there's an also big advantage of the blood products, uh, especially the PRP. It's, it was removed from the NADA observation list in 2011. So this means the local use is not forbidden. But be carefully, it's uh, not the systemic, the systemic use. So if you give the blood components back through the vein, then uh, you'll get the problems with the NADA, with the NADA code. So, um, but for the use that we have in orthopedic uh, sports medicine, the use of little amounts of plasma for local injection is no problem. So the therapeutic options in professional sports um, mainly three columns. You have the surgical treatment, the invasive treatment for big problems. You have the microinvasive treatment like needling and injection, and you have a completely conservative approach, which means just pharmacologically, physiotherapist treatment, um, and you need all these three columns um, to, to just um, treat your patient in the best way. Um, so. I was used to train as an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm now specializing since more than 10 years on microinvasive and conservative treatment. So in our network, we do have lots of, of surgeons um, that we can use for help, that we can ask for help um, if we have a, a problem, an injury that needs surgical treatment. Um, and on the other hand, the microinvasive techniques and the conservative treatment has become so complex and modern 
um, that it's very, very hard to overview all these three parts of the field. So I'd like to give you some examples of uh, athletes that we treated with PRP. So first of all, this is uh, an example of one of my colleagues. He's also based in Munich, and I'm very glad that he allowed me to use some of his, uh, of his pictures and uh, his case. So, uh, to be honest, this is himself. So he injured his, himself. He was a semi-professional uh, ski runner, and uh, he had a severe injury to his knee. So he had a two to three degree cartilage defect on the medial part of his knee, and he has also a complete ACL rupture. And you know, normally, if you have an athlete competing on a very high level of his sports, you likely to ask him to have an, a, a surgical uh, surgical repair of his ACL and uh, normally also of his cartilage. So he was very afraid of the surgical procedures, so he wanted to go for a PRP treatment in combination with physiotherapy and wearing an orthesis. So he used the, the, P, the ACP that's provided by Atrex, and so this was the, the time frame. So he had a period of, un, of complete unloading. Then he was using a very restrictive orthesis that gave a very reliable stability back to the knee. And then he was starting with the PRP injections three times. And then, like a... Five to six months later, he was starting with jogging, and then also one month later, one to one to two months later, with running and jumping. He did a very very tough back to sports testing, and I want to give you some insights what the um, what the ACL was doing. So uh, because of uh, another problem, he had an MRI scan just two years before the injury. So then you can see the ACL was completely intact. And this was the trauma in 2011. And you see the ACL completely ruptured. So there are just a bundle of fibers, but there's no, no dark and dense line, as you can see on the left side, which represents a normal ACL. Then you see four months later, already that uh, these fibers had become more dense and you see these formating bright gray area, which uh, represents a scar tissue formation. And then eight months after the trauma, you see that there's a dark line going at the same side where the natural ACL was. It's becoming a little bit more thick than it was the natural ACL, which represents scarring. But uh, you can see it was a completely a completely healed ACL with a conservative treatment using a series of PRP injection or thesis and physiotherapy, which I think this is um, something very special. And we uh, were able to observe this healing process, this accelerated healing process also in other cases. So this is a professional soccer player that I took care of and he had a severe medial ligament injury to his ankle and it was completely ruptured and normally this is also an indication to have a surgery. Um, the player refused to have surgery, he wanted to go for conservative treatment and asked me if we can do something to accelerate the healing process and uh, give him better chance for a good outcome. So we used a series of five PRP injections with an interval of one week and uh, you see the follow-ups three weeks later and after nine, after nine weeks, so it's a little bit more than two months. And you see uh, that you can see that the uh, ligament structure is uh, intact again. It's a scar, yes, but um, it's, um, it's running through. You can uh, follow the, the lines from the upper part, the medial ankle to uh, the root of the foot and um, it was also functionally completely recovered and he was able to have a return to play after like 10 weeks. So another case also from my team was a medial collateral ligament injury of the knee which is also a very severe uh, injury in soccer players that takes normally like four to six months to recover and in this special case 
um, the player already had two other MCL ruptures on the same side before. So it was the third re-rupture that he had, and this normally complicates the process a lot. So he refused to have, a, to have surgery, which I think was a good decision. And we also gave him four injections with PRP. It was ultrasonic, ultrasonographically guided. He got laser and ultrasound and cryotherapy, lymph drainage, local treatment, he wore a brace for only three weeks. And he was able to start running after three weeks with the brace. And I also give you the series of the MRI scans. So this was the MRI scan just uh, after the injury. So you see the torn ligament that is never, that's not attached anymore to the medial part of the femur bone. You see the bright fluid between the ruptured, um, between the ruptured ends of the ligament. And you also see that the ligament, a little bit more down, is, has these uh, sticky, this thickening and this uh, um, unregular structure. So this is the scar tissue formation from the last two uh, ruptures. And there you can see the follow-up MRI three weeks later. And you see there's these bright gray uh, material between the endings of the, of the torn ligament. And you also see that the ligament uh, in the uh, more down, so the scar tissue formation is reduced. So there was a remodeling of the, of the ligament. And um, so this is six weeks later, you see that it's all medical. Uh, almost completely healed and I think it's most impressive to see that also the, the scarring from the last injuries has become better and uh, the shape of the ligament uh, is more appropriate now. <coughs> but we do see also muscle tendon injuries. So this is a middle distance runner. So he was German champion in 2014 and seventh place in Europe 2014 and uh, so he was suffering from a sudden pain in the dorsal groin after very high intensity training so, and we did uh, an MRI scan on the same day revealing this injury so you see an intertendinous partial rupture of the semimembranosus tendon and you see all the surrounding fusion and fluid which represents an hematoma so he also received a series of PRP injections. Normally we are combining it with Tramil, so it's an herbal substance that um, also reduces the pain. And uh, it was also sonographic, so it was sonographically guided with an uh, interval of seven to 14 days. And also he also received physiotherapy. And um, so this is the follow-up. Um, not more than eight weeks later, and you see a complete restitution of the tendon. There's no discontinuity, there's no signal alteration anymore, you see no additional scarring, and uh, you see the complete resorption of the fluid and uh, the scar tissue formation, which I think is, uh, shows that um, the PRP does not just the blocking of, uh, of some reactions in your body, it's really, it's really supporting the healing process. And that's what we want to have. We want to have uh, not only uh, big scar tissue formation, we want to have um, restitution to, uh, to a very good functioning uh, uh, ligament on, or tissue. And, um, to end um, the series of cases I wanted to present you, I'd like to give you a case report of uh, a professional soccer player, and he's all, also a good friend of mine already, um, Patrick Herrmann, and he knows that I'm presenting his case, so he's fine with that. Um, it was like four years ago, he was suffering from an irritation of the upper ankle joint. He had to quit training for two days, despite of intense, to, intense physiotherapy. Um, there was swelling and pain of the ankle, just only little effusion, and we couldn't find any severe structure that damaged in the MRI scan. So, you know, the soccer players, um, when they become older, 
um, they would have like recurrent um, injuries of their ankles, resulting like some micro instability. And then if they have a high training load, like at the beginning of the season, and they prepare for for the first games, then uh, yes, the training burden becomes very high, and then these uh, these joints are likely to get some irritation. So uh, what we did was ultrasonographically guided PRP injection. It was just a one-time shot, three milliliter, also combined with Tramil, but not in the joint, just around the, the capsule. And uh, this was four days before the game, before the first game. And uh, what I want to show you, he was able to play on this game. And he made the most important goal. So I was not able to attend the, the game because um, we took surgical orthopedic doctors taking care of the club. So I texted him and I won't have to translate it to you. So he texted me, yes, everything is, was fine. It's, uh, two days after injection, it was like it, there, was, there never had been a problem. And I said, okay, congratulations for the goal. And it was a good performance. And he said, yes, thanks, Doc, we made it. We, had, we did a good performance, both of us. So it's always nice to have these results and um, to give us a summary of my of my thoughts about uh, the ACP treatment in professional sports. Most important, it's compatible according to WADA, uh, which means it's no doping problem. Uh, and there was a, a very, very tough change of the WADA code concerning corticosteroids. So we are not allowed to give them uh, 74 hours before the game or in the game, which means um, it puts you to very difficult problems if they are uh, the athlete needs some local treatment like one or two days before uh, an important game. Um, the PRP inject this injection is very effective, but not always fast. So sometimes it needs just four to six weeks to have the full result. There are very, very low side effects. There are no negative effect on performance. <clears throat> There's no only short break in training and competition cycle and a very, very low risk profile which I think it's, makes them the perfect, um, the perfect treatment choice. So thanks a lot for your, for your attending and uh, for your time, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Tonsha. Uh, yes, we've got a couple of questions in the chat box, so if we could answer those first, and then maybe we can open the floor to um, any other questions. So the first one, is how do you decide in whom to opt for conservative management or, or conservative treatment? And then the sittings of PRP, so depending on the pathology, I suppose, yes. what would be the number of PRP injections that you would uh, you would opt for? And does that change per, per patient, I'm guessing? Yes. So first of all, the, the decision on conservative or surgical treatment um, it is done by the diagnostics and also by the discussion with the patient. So if, the, if your athlete don't want to have surgery, even if it was the standard for the diagnosis he's having, you have to have an alternative. And second, the number of PRP injection varies. So if you have um, like a big injury and you need uh, connective tissue to close the, the wound again, like a ligament rupture, um, it's normally that it will take more time because you have to undergo all these stages of, uh, of remodeling and, and scar tissue formation to uh, get back to a, a functioning uh, structure. So they normally will have like three to five injections so, but if you have just an uh, irritation, like uh, the last player I showed you, then sometimes one injection can be enough. Okay, and then that number of injections, would that also change whether it's ligament, tendon, muscle, or yeah. would you follow the, same, the exact same protocol? No, 
Also, first of all, if you have muscle injuries, you have to be careful with using PRP. So we are using PRP mainly for connective tissue damage. But there's most of the muscle injuries are within connective tissue damage. So you will have damage of the fascias or of the intramuscular tendons. So then you have to use the PRP in this area and in this area only. So this is one other reason to administer it by sonographic guidance. Okay. One more question along the same lines. Although this is asking specifically for a complete tear in the ACL. Uh, what are your opinions on, on, on that type of patient? Um, when would you consider ACP? This is surgical treatment, etc. So, to be honest, I think it's there's there are rare cases of uh, athletes competing on a high level that can uh, cope with an S ACL rupture and uh, retain uh, intact structures just by uh, conservative treatment. I just wanted to show you the case to just give you an impression how. Uh, how yes, how effective the treatment can be. So uh, normally we would uh, recommend to have surgery and replace the ACL and then do the PRP treatment additionally to get a better outcome. Um, but yes, if you have an athlete or a patient who is refusing the surgery, then um, yes, physiotherapy or thesis and PRP injection might be worth to try. And um, but you then also have to tell them it will take a long time, so it's not um, it's not uh, shorter to do the the conservative treatment. It will also take at least half a year to to go back. Um, normally, even more, like nine to twelve months, and um, we will have like a series of four to five PRP injections that's necessary to, to treat a torn ACL uh, ligament. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, another question, more around the product in general. Uh, we know that the ACP specifically is, is used a lot throughout Europe, especially Germany. Um, within the Bundesliga itself, is, is, that the, is ACP the product that is used predominantly? Yes. I, um, I can say that very honestly because I know lots of most of the other uh, colleagues taking things, and I would say there's no there's no uh, Bundesliga club ex except one that is doing um, that's not doing uh, ACP treatment. Okay, great. Uh, another one on the difference more on the quality of PRP. So the quality of PRP varies five to ten times depending on the methods. And this is what is in the chat box. How do we decide if the PRP is usable or not for the injection? So I guess that's around the actual PRP product itself, right? How do we decide that the PRP we're using is correct? Well, you have to know you, you can just use the PRP that you get from the patient at the moment you want to treat them. So I think there's no way to do like a pre-treatment analysis of the PRP and I also don't think it's necessary. So it's just one explanation why sometimes one PRP shot makes a big difference and sometimes just a little. So you will also get some effect even if the uh, blood light count in the sample you got is low, but there's still a blood light inside and you will get some effect, but it's varying. So, because it's a natural product. Okay, so we've got another one just come in uh, along the same lines again. The difference between PRP and ACP. So we know that ACP is essentially PRP, but could you tell us more about what is the difference between why you are using ACP versus the PRP systems? Yeah, so well, you all know, I think that uh, PRP is the uh, overall expression for like, blood component um, containing plasma and high concentration of platelets. And ACP is one product of them um, provided by, by Atrex. And I think the big advantage is that it's so easy to use and it's so safe. So you won't probably find no other method that it's so quickly uh, in, in use and uh, gives us so a high grade of, uh, um, of safety concerning sterility and, and handling. 
So the established syringe is a very, very clever idea and uh, I, lots of colleagues and I will love it. Perfect. Okay, we've got a couple of hands raised. Um, if we can go first to, I think it's Rakesh. Hi, hi Tom. Thank you. Hi, Ralph. Good uh, talk. My, my question is, you have mentioned use of Xiaomi or Zen team as an integral part along with the ACP or like you have some indications or it's like your subjective decision uh, to in which cases to use and in which cases not to use. And I'm asking this question particularly because in 2005 to 2007 during my stay in Moscow we were treating many sports injuries and trauma, trauma and ZLT was very commonly used. What was lacking is a documentation ultrasonographically and MRI. So uh, now with the, uh, with the ACP uh, and with the Tromil, so what is the, uh, your, uh, like you, your choice, I mean, it's an integral part or it's like, uh, it's your decision, subjective decision? Yes, so um, we are using these drugs because they are widely spread in Europe, especially in Germany. So we have lots of experience with them and uh, um, we know that there is some effect some underlying effect but it's not very strong so um, i think to, uh, the prp injection is more powerful um, but also makes like a little bit more side effects at the beginning so you all know if you administer the, the acp first time you get a swelling and some pain for the first two or three days because you're just pushing all this inflammation process at the first time and um, we had the feeling so it's no it's no science behind that but just our feeling from the practical work that using it together with seal or traumil may lower these first side effects a little bit and that's why we use it together thank you Ralph. okay we have another hand raised by harry kuma uh, yes sir. actually uh, really nice evening uh, nice to meet all you uh, legends and uh, I just want to ask you things. I have been using these objects uh, here before many, many of the years. You know, my primary indication and most common indication in my opinion is a particular human contamination, which I see from 18 years to 15 years. And uh, that would be the fact most of the patients never turn out to be coming again to my opinion. Livelihood and issues. I still uh, believe that uh, maybe it's a coincidence with the serendipity, whatever you call it, uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of the patients uh, have shown benefit from this uh, contamination. And most of the, a few of the patients are cancers with bilaterally problems. They can't drill down because you know, in India, in India, all these dance bombs need to steal and spot. And all these they easily uh, revert back to their normal profession. So it's a, a new thing, it's phenomenal actually, it's good, uh, maybe by mistake it works or not, because I once a few times I tried, but it really works. Is it the one and the same which we use here, the ACP, the RFX, PRP, everything, is the one and the same? The method of the, uh, 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 during this PRP, one and the same? Uh, what, what was the question at the end there? I think the, the last bit was a bit unclear. It was cracking a little bit. I'm asking the... I'm ask, I'm, I was using this uh, Arthrex PRP some machine which is uh, being uh, uh, provided by a service provider in India. I uh, have been using this. This is the same method. Is there any change in method? You are telling that there is high variability in the methodology of preparation of this PRP. Is, it, is there anything peculiar with your method? Any change in the method since since before is what you're wondering, right? Um, no, for, from a product standpoint, the product manager, there's no no change in the method. It's been it's been the same for for almost a, a decade. It's the same method. Perfect. So how long it will take after procuring the blood when you spin? It's hardly some ten fifteen minutes. That the same. Five minutes spin, single spin. Okay. Well, work great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Dr. Prithviraj, I can see your hand is raised as well. Yeah, hi Dr. Rao, uh, I was really educational. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and being specialist at Nexus surgery as well. 
so it's very common practice in India that many of the sports injury uh, surgeons they usually uh, combine the ACP as well as with the hydrochloric acid. So I just wanted to know, does it have any extra added benefit or anything like that? Yes, so there's also some science behind this question. So we do have uh, studies comparing these two uh, um, um, these two methods and also uh, com comparing the single of these methods to the combination. And um, so it shows that there's no great, great additional effect if you use it together. So it's slightly better to use the PRP and the hyaluronic acid but you almost get the same uh, effect if you just use the PRP. And uh, also the evidence is growing more stronger that the PRP injection is a little bit more effective than the hyaluronic acid, especially concerning the long-term effect. So um, it's, it's also what we see in our daily practice, that if you have a patient with osteoarthritis and you gave him an injection series of like five times PRP, then sometimes they are... Uh, they will feel a pain relief um, of nine months or, or more. And uh, the hyaluronic acid, more like four to six months, um, if it really works good. So uh, that's why we, uh, we recommend for first-line treatment the PRP. But I also do have patients, as you said, they want to combine it. They want to have the hyaluronic acid and the PRP, and they have the feeling it's more effective. Also, there's no, no real evidence for that, but uh, we're doing... Oft, often we're doing it the same way, so yes, yeah, it's there and um, yeah, it seems to work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, any, the floor is still open for any questions, uh, and if not, we'll, we'll make a close. Uh, I just want to ask, what is the average, for example, how a patient with a knee pain and diagnosis with the blood work on the Malaysia? And you procure this uh, blood and uh, spinning for five minutes and you get the PRP. What is the average cost in US dollars? What is the average cost to the patient? And if it's a not pain, it's a pain to the patient. Just what compliance we just want to know. Hmm. Average cost to the patient, I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be able to answer that myself. Maybe there's some other docs on here that, that can help. <laughs> I'm asking, just for comparison, we differs in different regions, it's one and more. Because I found that it's much cheaper than uh, the hyaluronic acid injection. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in Germany it's almost the same between uh, good hyaluronic acid, so you already know that, I think you know that there are different uh, uh, companies uh, with different products, but if you want to have like a high quality hyaluronic acid, you would probably pay the same than for a PRP injection in Germany. But I think there are differences in prices from country to country because, you know, the, uh, the level of uh, medical care and um, the cost for medical care will, dif will differ between uh, uh, different societies. So uh, even in, in uh, Europe itself, so if you, uh, if you want to get a hyaluronic injection in Switzerland, it will be like four or five times... Uh, as expensive than in Germany, and maybe if you go to another um, uh, European country, it would be much cheaper than in Germany. So uh, I think it's not, it's, it's hard to answer this question generally. Okay, how frequently do you give the infections? For example, it's an aspirant, a footballer, the basketball player, he has a new rank between how many injections? And, and on how many weeks do they will do routine new practice? Do you, might, you mean how many injections I give every day or just in a special case? Yeah, no, I think for, as a general rule, for his own reason, I believe he's a football player, he's a high out that he has a severe anti pain or any pain. What is it general? Just, I don't want to precise, but every week you give it for 25 injections? Yeah. Every week? Or five weeks. So, I think an uh, interval of uh, less than five days uh, is critically because you get this first time reaction um, after the injection and it needs like two or three days to, uh, to have the anti-inflammatory effect and then if the next injection is too close then uh, you may sum up the, um, 
this irritation and causing more trouble and pain. So I think you shouldn't go under five days. And then I think if you have more than 10 days in between, then the effect of the last injection is just uh, just going away already. So I think seven between seven and, and nine days is a good uh, is a good interval. But uh, it depends on the reaction of the patient. If you have a patient uh, coming along very well with the injection, you can do every five every five days. Also, if you're in a rush, but um, you have to carefully counsel the patient. Yes. Is there any guideline that at least will take minimum of five injections? At least how many doses minimum you should take to get the best results? Is there any guidelines from your side? Well, the well, there's no real guidelines for that, but uh, we do have like experience, and um, so our experience is that, um, especially for chronic conditions like osteoarthritis or uh, cartilage defects, um, a series of, of less than three injections not working. We have just a short time effect then, and um, it also seems that a series of five injections is working very well in these patients. Yes. In the arthritis is also you follow the same uh, interval or you just expand the interval, maybe by weekly or once in a month? Yeah. Yes, so after the patient went through the first cycle, had his first uh, five injections, then normally they are, uh, have a pain reduction for at least half a year. So if not, then you should do further, further uh, diagnostics. Um, and then we ask them to come back to have like a maintenance therapy and um, I think you can go for uh, different regimes then. So some of the patients they want to just have like after six months they come back for a single injection and then come back like every three months for, for one injection. Um, what we recommend is like having a series of five injections and then after like six to nine months having another three. So uh, that's then normally you will see a patient who's very happy because he's not experiencing any pain in daily life, and um, if he's a, if he's an athlete, he normally will can compete on a, on a normal level. Okay, thank you. Okay, quick one uh, on the topic of arthritis. There's a comment in the chat. Um, so, Doctor, we know that there's good evidence based around ACP in the use of arthritic patients. Um, what, what's your experience with treating arthritic patients with, with ACP? Well, we have very good results. So, um, the only thing you have to really uh, counsel your patient very carefully at the beginning because he will receive some discomfort at the beginning and very short after the injections. So, uh, and if where the patient is used to getting hyaluronic acid injections before, then maybe the first time he will be a little bit afraid because he he's feeling that uh, there's a process going on in his knee. Okay. I think uh, if there's no more questions from the floor, guys, last 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 shout. And is it the same thing which has been used by um, uh, some neurologists also or many events? Is the same products? Is the one and the same? Sorry, I didn't get the, the question. So, the same product then? I think, is it the same PRP which has been used in other specialties also other than architects like neurology? Uh, some geriatric lung conditions are also they use. Is it true that it's only the same? Yeah, so in Germany, I think the ACP is the most, absolutely most spread um, uh, PRP product. Um, and it's, it's used by a wide variety of, uh, of specialists, but mainly in orthopedics. Um, so, but I know that uh, plastic surgeons, they use PRP. Um, I do know that uh, that also geriatric uh, colleagues are using it and pediatrics. So, well, the good thing is um, if you have like a very young or very old people to treat, 
um, you're not afraid of the side effects of the medication, which becomes more and more important in uh, uh, in an elder society like the German. So, yeah. Okay, we have another question come into the chat box. Uh, what is your experience of combining PRP treatments with steroids? Yes, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> so um, normally the, the studies, the science will tell us that uh, the corticosteroid will like, uh, be counterproductive to the effect of PRP and that uh, if you gave it together then the corticosteroid will block all the, the beneficial effects of PRP. But um, we had some cases when we had to give it together because uh, maybe the PRP injection was not working uh, as quickly enough or sometimes when an, one of the athletes already had received a corticosteroid injection that was not uh, successful and then uh, wanted to have a PRP injection additionally. And um, to be honest, we often saw some tremendous effect even if there was a uh, uh, corticosteroid administration together with the PRP or in a very shortly uh, time frame. So I can't I can't explain why, but it still seems to work. Not in every case, but uh, unexpectedly often. So, but I don't I would not recommend it for that. But um, so if you've got a patient and he already received a corticosteroid injection and it was not successful, and he's asking you. Can we still do PRP? So my answer would be yes. We had like 20 to 40 patients with this constellation and they were all, most of them were, uh, had a good result after the PRP injection, although there was corticosteroid before. Okay, we've got another good question in the chat box and then I'll open the mic to Dr. Hiri. Um, so do you recommend local anesthetics while injecting PRP? So we don't recommend it, so because you know there are, there are good studies showing that um, the local anesthetic have have an, uh, a very negative effect on tissue, especially on cartilage, but also on ligaments and tendons. So that's why we try to avoid it. And um, no, and no, colleagues, they are doing first the local anesthetic injection and then using the, um, the PRP and they also have good results. So I think it seems to be the same that uh, we're experiencing in uh, with corticosteroids. The effect of the PRP seems to be so powerful that it can overrule the, the negative effects of local anesthetics and uh, corticosteroids. But on the other hand, if you can avoid these negative effects, then you should do that. So there's no need to recommend local anesthetic or, or corticosteroid injection, even uh, if we have the experience that uh, PRP might work also. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Giri, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, uh, Dr. Raff, I thought of asking you, uh, in, in, this, uh, in India uh, recently, we have been using uh, Bone marrow acid concentrate for uh, chondromalacia than PRP. What's your experience uh, in bone marrow acid concentrate versus PRP? So then you are more experienced than me. I don't have experience with that, to be honest. <laughs> You're just using PRP. Um, so maybe uh, um, when we get some. Uh, um, facilities here in, in the club uh, allowing us uh, also to work with bone marrow we will try it but at the moment i can't imagine because it's you have to have a high standard of, uh, of medical care to um, uh, to do this uh, type of treatment and um, we are not a hospital we are just a, a football club so it's hard for us to build up facilities to save do this treatment so but yeah, yeah. Well, what's your experience with it <laughs> I have been experiencing with the PRP, but uh, I do know DMAC is uh, working, but uh, I'm not uh, able to quantify how, how far it's going. But it's uh, costly, I feel, when it comes to PRP. Mm -hmm. 